Well, let's um, pray together as we begin. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that your plans are always wise and good. And in your words, you tell us what they are. Uh, please help us to believe what you say and give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How do I know I'll make it to the end? The yeah, Christian life is sometimes compared to a race, and it's more like a marathon than a sprint. Not that I have much experience with either. Uh, but when you start the race, you feel good. Your legs are fresh. Your lungs feel great. Maybe you have a few friends to run the race with you. But as the miles start to add up, you start to feel worse. Maybe you get injured along the way, and now you have to fight through the pain. Maybe a friend drops out, and he was so encouraging in the beginning, but he's not running the race anymore. And maybe you're starting to wonder if you can actually finish, because everything is harder and heavier, and the end seems such a long way away. And all you can see in front of you is this mountain you have to climb, and your legs are already shot, and your friends are starting to flag. So can I really make it to the end? Paul says that the end is absolutely worth it. And if you're a Christian, you believe that. Of course it is. Every Christian wants to say, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. Every Christian wants to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Every Christian wants to see all the people who have finished ahead of us. In verse 24, Paul says, in this hope, you were saved. In verse 25, he says, wait for it with patience. This is something worth waiting for. And if you're a Christian, you know that. You believe it. And you want to finish the race. You want to make it to the end, still trusting in Jesus and still waiting for the new creation to come. But there are so many distractions along the way, so many reasons to drop out of the race. It's so easy, isn't it, to stop looking forward to the new creation and instead settle for this creation, because I can touch this and see this and enjoy it right now. And the food is good and the houses are comfortable, and the cities are, um, well, they're at least not too close to us. And yes, I know it's better in the new creation. There's a banquet of rich food and well-aged wine. There's a room in my father's house. And the heavenly city will be glorious. That seems like such a long way away. Why keep waiting for the last day when there's so much to enjoy today? Or maybe you're having a very different kind of experience. And instead of being distracted, you're distressed. And I'm reading chapter 8, and I see words like glory and freedom and redemption and hope. But what if I'm not very hopeful right now? What if I'm at the end of my rope? What if my view of the future is very dim? And all I can see is this mountain in front of me, and the finish line is nowhere in sight. Paul says we should wait for it with patience. But what if I don't know how much longer I can wait? How do I know I'll make it to the end? Well, Paul says that you will. Whether you're distracted or distressed, whether you're in plenty or wants, in joy or sorrow, in sickness or health, you will make it home. That's what Paul says in our text today. You will certainly make it home. And here's the first reason you can be sure of that. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. God's children never run this race alone. And their helper is the Spirit himself. We're looking at verses 26 and 27. And let me read from verse 26. 
Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Now, a prayer is hard for all of us, isn't it? Um, anyone who says it isn't is probably lying. We should probably pray for them if we remember to pray. Well, we all find it hard. We're all failures when it comes to prayer. But here's one way it shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be hard to know what to pray. Jesus taught us what to pray. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Most of us know it by heart. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray for these things. Pray to our Father in heaven. And pray first for his name, his kingdom, and his will. And then pray for your needs, your forgiveness, and your fight against evil. Pray for those things, Jesus says, and maybe in that order. Because we often forget to pray for God's name and God's kingdom and God's will. And we just launch right in with our own needs and wants. Knowing what to pray might be the easiest thing about praying. And yet Paul says that because of our weakness, we do not know what to pray. So why is it that we do not know when Jesus taught us so clearly? Well, it seems to me that we forget to know, or we'd rather know something else, or we've just given up entirely. It seems our weakness is worse than we'd like to admit. Just think about all the things that Jesus says about prayer. So Jesus says that his father is a good father. And he gives good gifts to his children. Now, that doesn't mean he gives us everything. No good father gives their children everything they ask for. That's called spoiling them. That's not being a good father. So God doesn't give us everything. But he does give us good things. But part of me doesn't believe that anymore. So that part of me no longer prays. Or here's another thing Jesus says. Um, he, he tells us to be like the persistent widow, to keep pestering God until he makes it right. And he tells us that he won't delay long. It won't be any longer than necessary. He says he will be quick. And every time I hear a sermon on that text, I resolve to be persistent in prayer. But that resolve rarely lasts a week. This is our weakness. Instead of praying as Jesus taught, we pray too little or we pray for other things because our hearts are divided and our minds are distracted. Or maybe we fall in silence because we're crushed with disappointments. What's the point in praying when God never answers or the answer is always no? And so we no longer pray. This is our weakness. We do not know what to pray, even though Jesus taught us. And so we fail to pray as we should. Now, I said this would be encouraging. So here's the encouragement. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. And he steps in and prays for us. Let me read again from verse 26. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And I love that word for, the Spirit intercedes for us. So it's not that he reminds us what to pray. It's not even that he moves us to pray. He just does it for us. We are so weak that he has to do it himself. And in a way, that's encouraging, isn't it? The Spirit sees our weakness. He sees us wandering off in distraction or collapsing in distress. He sees us failing to pray. But he doesn't turn away in disgust. He doesn't leave us to our own devices. He picks us up and he carries us for as long as we need his help. Prays for us, not with us, but for us. 
And he doesn't even use words. It's a groaning too deep for words, Paul says. That sometimes you have a relationship with someone when you, you can look at that person a certain way and they know exactly what you want to say. And from the context and the history, they know exactly what you mean when you give them that look. That usually it means you're in trouble. That's the relationship the spirit has with the father, Not that they're in trouble, but they understand each other perfectly. So when the spirit prays, he always gets it right. His prayers are always perfect because he already knows what the father wants and he prays according to his will. And again, what an encouragement that is. Even if we are failing at prayer, Paul says that the spirit is always getting it right. So whatever needs to be prayed, the spirit is praying that for you. And if you forget to pray for yourself or forget to pray for your family or forget to pray at all, Paul says there's one person who never forgets to pray and he's praying for you, he says. The next verse may be even more encouraging. Uh, verse 27, Paul talks about the one who searches hearts. And normally that title is used when speaking of God as judge. So when God the judge searches our hearts, what will he see? He knows all of our secrets. So what will he find? Will he find that we're praying too little? Or praying for the wrong things? Or maybe not praying at all? That's not what Paul says. Have a look at verse 27. When God searches our hearts, he doesn't see our weakness. He doesn't see our inconsistent and non-existent prayer lives. What he sees is the Spirit praying for you. He sees the mind of the Spirit. And those are the prayers he hears. The ones that are according to his will. We sometimes talk about the imputed righteousness of Jesus. So that's you getting the credit for everything he did right. So that's what it means to have his righteousness imputed to you. It means that his perfection counts for you. Here Paul is telling us about the imputed prayer life of the Spirit. And when our prayers simply won't do, the Spirit says to the Father, don't listen to that. Listen to my prayers instead. Um, I once heard the story of a man um, who got everything he asked for. And whenever he asked for something, his father always said yes. And I thought, what a spoiled brat. What an irresponsible parent. But this man said, let me tell you why my father always said yes. I only asked for things. I knew he was willing to give. I only ever asked according to the will of my father. That's why he always said yes. And that's how the spirit prays. He prays according to God's will. He prays for things that God is already inclined to give. And his prayers count for you. And that brings us to our next point. The will of the Father. At the end of verse 27, Paul says that the Spirit prays according to the will of God. But what is that exactly? What are the things that God is inclined to give, the things he wants his children to have? I'll have a look at verse 28. And this is what God wants us to have. We know that for those who love God... All things work together for good. It's a lovely verse, isn't it? God works all things for the good of those who love him. But what does that mean? Does it mean we'll have an easy life? Well, let's not think about that too much. Let's print it on a magnet and stick it on our fridge. And let's just look at it. It looks very nice. Let's not think about that too much. That's what I call a fridge magnet verse. Well, today I want us to take that verse off the 
fridge and put it back in Romans 8. So I want us to read it in context. And let's start with the phrase, all things. Now I take it, all things includes all that groaning in verses 18 to 27. The pains of childbirth, the futility of creation, its bondage to decay, the sufferings of this age. There are things in this world that would discourage even the strongest Christian. And I take it, all things includes those things, the things that cause us pain, the things we would never choose for ourselves. So yes, God is working all things for good, but God is using things I would choose for myself and things I would never choose for myself. God is using both kinds of things. And what is the good that he works? What is his will or purpose? Well, have a look with me at verse 29. And here we find God's will, the purpose to which he has called us. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So that is God's purpose, to make us more like Jesus. This is God's will for his son to have a family that looks like him. And notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say anything about the kind of life we'll have in this world. It just says that God wants us to be like Jesus. That is the good he is working for all of us. And if it means that we suffer, so be it, so long as it makes us more like Jesus. Now, in the past, um, I've taught this verse to mean the character of Jesus. So perhaps God wants us to be more humble like him. And suffering is a way of humbling all of us. Or uh, maybe he wants us to be more compassionate. And one of the best ways to learn empathy is to suffer. Now, that is right, but it's only half right. And if you stop there, you're missing the bigger point. In this life, we will only ever be half saved, half redeemed, half finished. We're only halfway there. It's only in the next life, when we are glorified with Jesus, that we finally become like him. So, yes. The good that God is working is to make us more like Jesus. But that must mean more than just changing our character. It must also mean bringing us home and getting us all the way to glory. I'm sure you've met people who um, never finish their projects and their house is littered with unfinished gardens and um, unfinished cars, unfinished Legos, whatever their hobby might be. That's not what God is like. He doesn't abandon his projects. He doesn't lose interest halfway. He doesn't get distracted from what he's doing. He always finishes what he started. And this is God's plan for your life. To make you like Jesus. To get you to the finish line. To carry you if necessary. God's great purpose is to bring you all the way to glory. And everything that happens along the way is for your good to bring you safely home. Now, does it make those things along the way any easier? I'm afraid the answer is no. Does this mean that God's plan will always make sense? Again, the answer is no. God makes trade-offs that we would never make. And he uses things we would never choose for ourselves. When I pray the Lord's Prayer, the third petition is always the hardest. Your will be done. The other ones are much easier to pray. But this one is very hard. Not my will 
but yours be done. When Jesus prayed that, he ended up on a cross. When we pray that, it will mean something like the cross. Because Jesus says to his followers, if you want to come after me, then take up your cross and follow me. I don't know why God makes the choices that he does. Like I said, these are not the ones I would have made. But I don't need to know why. I just need to know that there was a reason for it. That God had a plan behind it. That there's a purpose to everything he does. I just need to know that his children do not suffer in vain. And that's enough for me. And if Jesus is the template and his life is the pattern for ours, well, there's the proof I need that God knows what he's doing. If God could bring something good out of the cross, if he could save so many through the murder of his son, if he can bring that much good out of that much evil, well, this is a God I can trust. He does not waste the death of his children. He knows exactly what he is doing, and he will surely bring us home. And notice verse 29. God planned your life before you were born. He foreknew you and predestined you. And these words are not meant to start a theological debate. They're meant to bring comfort and assurance to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And if you're a Christian, this is what Paul says. God chose you before the foundation of the world. He knew you long before your parents did, before they planned to have you or didn't plan to have you as the case may be. But you belong to God first. Before you belong to your parents or your spouse or anyone else, you belong to God first. And verse 30 lays out the course of your life, the events that God planned for you before you were born. And it's a strange little biography because it's missing some major milestones, namely your birth and your death. And I wonder if that changes the way we think about the Christian life. If you think about it, the shortest bio about your life will be the one on your gravestone. Your date of birth, your date of death, and maybe something nice about you. And all of that will fit on one line. And everything in between is just a single dash. That is the sum total of your life, that dash between your birth and your death. And when you see it that way, it seems so short and final and pointless. But verse 30 is a very different kind of bio. And this one also fits on one line. But this one has no beginning or end because it begins and ends with God. You were predestined. That means you were conceived in God's mind before the foundation of the world, before the beginning of the universe. Then you were called. That's the day you became a Christian, the day you were born again. Then you were justified, declared to be right with God. And then you were glorified. You made it to the end, that happy ending where you reign with Jesus forever. And did you notice that last one is in the past tense? Strictly speaking, it's still in the future. We haven't been glorified yet. But from God's point of view, it's as good as done. He wrote your entire life before you were born. And God's first draft is always his last one. He never makes mistakes. He never changes his mind. It always goes according to plan. And those who are justified will always be glorified. I notice what is not in that line. 
Some of the happiest days of your life are not here in verse 30. The day you graduated, the day you were married, the day your children were born. Some of the saddest days of your life are also not here, whatever those may be. And it's not that these days are unimportant, but compared to God's plan for your life, they really belong in the footnotes. Even your birth and your death, God says, put those in the footnotes. You weren't really alive until I called you as my child. And strictly speaking, you never really died. You just finished the race and fought the good fight and made it safely home. Don't believe what you see on the gravestone. If you're a Christian, then verse 30 is the story of your life. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let me close by going back to the question we asked at the start. Will I make it to the end? Will I finish the race I started? I am so weak, I don't even know what to pray. So how can I make it to the end? Well, if you forget to ask for help, that's okay. Because the Spirit is asking for you. And even if you fall in silence, the Spirit never stops praying. And it's those prayers that count for you. And when your prayers are absent or distracted or inconsistent, the searcher of hearts does not see your weakness. Instead, he sees the Spirit groaning on your behalf. And the Spirit says to the Father, please make sure they get home. And the Father says to the Spirit, that was my plan all along. I wrote their lives before they were born. And let me tell you how it ends. It ends with them in glory. My son will have a family and they will look just like him. And when you make it home, Jesus will say, you made it. Come, eat and drink. The table is laid and the feast is ready. And when you're finished, let me take you to your room. And along the way, make sure you stop and say hello to the people who finished ahead of you. Take your time. Go and find your old friends. We have all the time in the world. And in the meantime, as we wait, God works all things for the good of those who love him. So if you love him, no matter what happens, you can always say this. Let my enemies do their worst. It is still God's best. And even when I am my own worst enemy, the Spirit is my constant friend. And with the help of the Spirit, according to the will of my Father, I will surely make it home. Let me close in a short prayer. God works all things for the good of those who love him. Father, we thank you that you are a good and wise and loving God. And you do not make mistakes. You know exactly what you're doing. And your purpose is to bring us safely home. When we cannot trace your hand, help us to trust your hearts. You are a good and loving father. And you give good things to your children. And for those who are not your children, help them to see the goodness of Jesus and the hope we have in him. And may they turn to him and ask, will you always give to those who ask? 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.